Question 71. Convenience yield most likely refers to the benefit of Statement 1. Holding an asset for sale. Statement 2. Being able to take advantage of volatility in the market to sell high. Or 3. Using the asset on demand if necessary. Um, so convenience yield is generally going to be referring to real assets or commodities. Um, and so if we hold that commodity physically, then these are uh, benefits that we can potentially reap the rewards of. Um, so if we look at a copper mining company, for example, that might have some copper on their balance sheet after they've mined it, these are all benefits that they can have um, from holding that asset. So they can hold the asset for sale, they can keep the copper on their balance sheet and keep it for sale. Um, they can use volatility in the market to sell it at a higher price, um, so that's also a benefit. And they can also use the asset on demand to produce something um, and create value that way. Um, so we're going to go with C. All three of these are um, benefits of convenience yield. And just one thing to point out, when we're holding a commodity, there's obviously other uh, factors that we need to consider, like the storage costs. So we need to make sure that the convenience yield outweighs any um, storage and, or maintenance costs related to the commodity. Question 72. Which of the following statements are most likely to be correct regarding typical contemporary hedge funds? So we've got three statements here, and we got to determine which of them are correct in order um, to pick our answer. So as we mentioned before, if an answer is if a statement is in all three, that means it must be correct. Um, so if we're looking at if we're working on the exam, we go ahead and just skip statement two. Um, but we'll go over it during this just for our own edification. All right, statement one: They have high investment restrictions and have a goal of generating high returns, either in an absolute sense or over a specified bench market. That certainly sounds like a uh, characteristic of a hedge fund, so we'll say one is correct. Two, they are set up as private investment partnerships open to a limited number of, limited number, number of investors. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so generally, this is also correct. Um, hedge funds are typically not going to be available to everyone to start with, and they're normally looking for big investments from their investment from their investors um, so they don't have to raise capital from a bunch of uh, different small investors. They have their main capital base from a smaller number of folks that they need to answer to or provide um, support to in other ways. Uh, three, they have an aggressively managed portfolio of investments across asset classes and regions that is leveraged and or use derivatives. Um, this is certainly also a uh, characteristic of uh, typical hedge funds. Uh, so we will go with C. One, two, and three are all correct. Question 73. Which of the following is not exhibited by alternative investments in comparison to traditional investments? So two of these are going to be um, statements that differentiate alts from traditional, and one of them will not be. So A, more liquidity of assets held. Um, so right away, I think we can go ahead and pick that as our probable answer. Alternatives are generally going to be less liquid um, than traditional investments. Um, but let's just make sure we can go ahead and rule out B and C. B, less regulation and transparency. They will have less regulation and transparency, so we can go ahead and rule that out. And as I think we've mentioned in other questions before, this is mainly just because of the type of um, investor in alternative investments, they're generally people of higher net worth due to the purchase um, and net worth requirements, or they're going to be institutions, so the SEC kind of assumes some level of sophistication and or ability to kind of um, absorb losses if they come about from these opaque strategies, more opaque strategies. Uh, and then C, more specialization by investment managers. This is also... Um, going to be true. If you look at something like um, private equity, that's going to be 
they're going to be more specialized in the sense of venture capital or buyout managers, but then even further down, venture capital might break more into um, specific sectors like technology or business size and what stage of the seed round they, uh, they'll they invest in. Um, whereas a public mutual fund is going to be more likely to invest across multiple different sectors um, and may have the ability to invest across all or most market cap ranges too. So. All that to say, we'll go with A, more liquidity um, when alts really exhibit less liquidity. Question 74, which of the following conditions will most likely decrease the value of a call option? A, increase in volatility. An increase in volatility is actually going to increase the value of a call option. Um, as volatility increases, it makes it more likely that the call option would get close to or uh, go into go into the money um, because the price is gyrating more it's going to be more likely to shoot up and um, increase that value um, so we can cross off a b increase in stock price this is also going to increase the value of a call option not decrease it um, the value of a call if you is a call option is long the stock so if the stock goes up the value of the call is also going to go up uh, so that leaves us with C, decrease in the risk-free rate, um, which will be correct. I just want to pull in an example here um, that's pretty simplified that kind of shows our point. Um, so this is the put-call parity formula. So I've got the value of the call option here on the left, and then we've got our underlying plus the put uh, minus our risk-free bond. And so... I'm using the same three variables or the same three numbers here for the SP and, and strike price variables. So we've got 98 for the hypothetical price of the stock, put cost $2, and the uh, strike price is 100 So the only thing I toggled here was the risk-free rate. So in the first scenario, I put a 5% risk-free rate. Second scenario, I put a 2.5% interest rate. Um, and we can see as the interest rate decreases, it decreases the value of that call option. Um, so this is, I think, just a helpful quick exercise with simple numbers to kind of show the answer there. And then this is also from the reading, which is kind of just a helpful chart to take a look back at and uh, just to help you know what the different factors do to the value of the calls and puts. So, Long-winded way to uh, get to answer C, decrease in the risk-free rate. Question 75, which of the following is most likely to be a key reason or reasons for investing in real estate? So we've got three statements here, and then uh, our answers are dependent on which statements um, we think are correct. So start with statement one, potential to provide an inflation hedge if rents can be adjusted quickly for inflation. So this is going to be um, correct or a good reason to invest in real estate. Take apartments as an example. Um, if your property taxes or maintenance costs are increasing due to inflation, um, when uh, it may be built into the lease or when your tenant's lease is up, you'll be able to raise your rents in order to account for those increased costs. Um, so this will be a good reason. Statement two. Prospects that multiple year leases with fixed rents for some property types may lessen cash flow impact from economic shocks. This is also going to be true and kind of applies to a different example or a different type of real estate than uh, we were talking about in statement one. So this would apply more to commercial properties and renting to businesses that have good um, business models and cash flow in order to make it through different economic cycles. As long as your businesses are able to stay afloat, then they should be able to keep paying you rent. Um, so we've got one and two correct so far. Let's look at three. Um, potential for competitive long-term total returns driven by both income generation and capital appreciation. Real estate has um, benefits of both of these, income generation and the capital appreciation. You can collect your rent money along the way, and uh, your property can also increase in value. So we'll go with A. All three of these statements are correct. 
Question 76. Which of the following is least likely a compensation structure used in alternative investments? So two of these are going to be compensation structures and one will not. So we've got A, dividends. Um, this seems like it's probably going to be our answer right off the bat. It's generally not a uh, type of compensation structure um, that would be used in alternatives. It's going to be, this is going to relate more to traditional investments and um, payouts to shareholders. Uh, B, soft hurdle rate. Um, hurdle rates are certainly used a lot in alternative investments and is referring to um, some rate of return that the manager needs to clear in order to get their incentive compensation. Uh, and then C, high watermark. This is also a con compensation structure used. Um, this is most important when a manager's had a poor year and maybe their returns were negative. Um, if they had $100 at, say, at their peak and now the fund is down to 80, they would need to get their performance back up above 100 um, in order to start collecting or looking at uh, different incentive fees. Um, so we'll go with A, dividends. Question 77. From the put call parity, the long bond is most likely equivalent to. Um, so we've got long asset, different combinations of long or short asset, long or short put, or long or short call. So we just need to use our formula here and solve for the bond um, in order to figure this out. So what we're doing here is we're taking that put call parity and we're moving the uh, call over to this side in order to just be looking at what the risk-free bond equals. Um, so in order to do that, we say we subtract the call. And so then when we're looking at this side, the positive or negative are gonna determine what, whether we're going long or short. Um, so we'll use that to uh, interpret our answer here. So we've got positive S, which is gonna be long the underlying, so long the asset. So that leaves A and B still in play here since we've got long the asset. Um, so we can probably go ahead and cross off C. And we'll be long the put since we've got positive on the P. Um, here we've got short put. Here we've got long put. Um, so we can probably go ahead and cross off A here now. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to be minus C, which means we're going short the call. And it looks like that's what we've got on B here. So B is correct. Question 78. Strategies that use technical analysis to identify companies that are under and overvalued and to ascertain relationships between securities are known as A, uh, fundamental value. So fundamental value is going to be using uh, under and overvalued. Um, we're going to be looking for companies that are undervalued that we're probably going to go long in. Um, and then we're likely not shorting overvalued, but we're going to be uh, avoiding those overvalued companies. And so fundamental value is not really going to use technical analysis or uh, be looking to ascertain relationships between those different types of securities. We're more so looking for companies that we think are worth more than the uh, market is giving them value for. Um, so we can go ahead and cross off a quantitative directional um, this uh, does sound like it may be what the um, questions describing technical analysis is generally going to be lean more towards quantitative strategies and then also we're ascertaining relationships between the securities so this is going to be likely some type of regression analysis that we're using um, which is going to be quantitatively focused. Um, so we're probably using this in the under overvalued to decide which securities to go long and short. Um, so we can, let's tentatively pencil in B, but just make sure C um, isn't correct. Fundamental growth, this is going to be picking stocks that we think are going to grow faster than the market um, or faster than the market expectations are giving um, and then hoping that those outperform on that basis. So um, not really relating to what's being mentioned in the question. So we'll go with B, quantitative directional. Question 79. BCG Bank has a one month value at risk of 400 million with a probability of 5%. This most likely uh, implies a 
Um, a, loss of 20 million will occur one month from now. B, one month maximum loss of 400 million will occur 5% of the time. Or C, one month minimum loss of 400 million will occur 5% of the time. So the only difference between B and C here is that maximum um, versus minimum. So we'll need to determine that there and then uh, also look at what A is implying here. So VAR measures the minimum amount of loss expected for a given period at a given probability level. Um, so A is giving us a little too certain of an answer. It's just taking our 400 million times that 5% probability and saying this is what the loss will be one month from now. Um, it's not really taking into account the probability level. Um, and then B is going to be incorrect um, due to that maximum loss statement. As we just said in the definition, um, it's going to be the one month minimum loss is kind of what the uh, VAR is giving us for that five for the uh, probability level. Um, so we'll go with answer C. Question 80. Which of the following is most likely the first order risk measure of the change in the option price for a change in the underlying uh, underlying assets volatility? A. Rho. Rho measures the change in interest rates, um, so it's not going to be related to the volatility. Um, and it's also not going to be a first order measure, um, so we can cross off A. B. Vega. Um, v, uh, Vega does measure the change in price for the change in vol. Um, this is pretty much the definition right there of Vega. Um, so we can go ahead and circle B, but let's just make sure we can rule out C. C, Gamma uh, measures a change in the delta for the change in the underlying. Um, so this is going to be a second order risk measure as well, and also um, uh, not related to the assets volatility um, like Vega is. So we'll go with B.